Um, before I read the scripture, I'd just like to share with you a testimony that I have of my grandson. Uh, I want to share it with everyone because a lot of people in this church have been praying for him, including the ladies downstairs when I used to go to uh, the, the Bible study downstairs and then with my life group now. Uh, we've been praying for him. He's 24 years old. Um, I've been uh, the only godly influence in his life over the years. Uh, and so from the time he's about seven till now, I've been taking him for lunch once, once a month. And uh, even after I moved out to the acreage, I still met him for, for lunch once a month. And we had some good talks about God. And then about uh, two years ago, uh, he prayed the sinner's prayer. And so um, it was a long ways for us to go and pick him up to bring him to church, but he's had no church since then. So then about uh, two months ago, his mother uh, got a job in Victoria, and they moved to Victoria. I was devastated, of course, and couldn't see why that would happen. But um, uh, his mother's job took, uh, she got work in Victoria that she couldn't very well turn down, so they went to Victoria. And, and then um, I was looking for a church for him in Victoria because he said he would really like to start going to church there. So I phoned around and Googled everywhere in Victoria and talked to several pastors, and I found him a free evangelical church or evangelical free in Victoria. And uh, he went there and... Uh, it's been wonderful. He uh, really uh, hooked up with the pastor there. They're very good friends now, and he finally has friends. He didn't have any friends when he was in Edmonton. He lived a very lonely life. So uh, then I knew why God sent them. And last Sunday, he was baptized in that church, and I was able to go on Zoom and watch it online. So that's why I wasn't here last Sunday. So praise the Lord for that. There's a lot of people here that... that uh, know the situation, and have been praying for him. So I want to thank you all for your prayers. Now I'm reading from James, chapter 5, verse 7 to the end. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth. Yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So we are finishing our series in James. This is the last message, and, and then we're going to uh, go into some Christmas messages. And then starting the new year, we'll go back to Genesis and work our way through the rest of Genesis and see where we go from there. So over the last several months, is we know we've been seeing a growing divide among Christians over wearing masks. You have two camps, the pro-mask people uh, view the anti-mask people as being reckless and not taking COVID seriously. And then the anti-mask people believe wearing masks may not be that effective. 
Their argument is that COVID cases are rising even with mask mandates. And so there's all this two camps and two views. And, and if you follow the debate on social media, you, you may notice the discourse gets nasty, even, even to the point of threatening each other. Well, instead of discord, what we're going to learn from this passage in James is that we need to practice self-restraint, which allows us to refrain from hostile responses in the face of provocation. What we're going to see in this passage as we finish off uh, James, I call the message God's prescription for pandemics. You could say God's prescription for difficult times. What we're going to see is that his prescription for the times that we're in is to persevere with patience in light of all the different things and stresses that are going on. To engage in prayer and praise as we walk through this difficult time and to pursue prodigals. Because what we will see is that in difficult times and stressful times, some choose to walk away from the faith. Now, some of the people addressed in, in, uh, in this letter were growing impatient in the face of trials. They had been persecuted. The context of this was that there was a major persecution in Jerusalem, and the Jewish believers got scattered all across the, the region. And as a result, they lost their, all their assets, their homes, and their jobs, etc. And so they were facing trials, and they were growing impatient in their circumstances. Well, since it's hard to be patient when things are out of control, James gives us an example of patience from the world of farming. And let's look at verse 7. It says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. Well, as many of you know, we, uh, before moving here to Spruce Grove several years ago, we lived in Carbon, a small little village south of here. A farming community. I learned a lot about farming living in Carbon, though I wouldn't make a very good farmer. I'd go bankrupt in no time flat if I was ever a farmer. But they were under constant stress during growing season. Sometimes there was not enough moisture. Other times it would hail. Or it might rain during the time of harvest. I remember sometimes Coming back from Calgary late at night, I would see farmers combine in the early hours of the morning so they can get the crop off before the frost sets in. Lots and lots of unpredictable things happen to the farmer. But the value of the harvest gave them reason to endure all the setbacks, all the unpredictable factors associated with farming. Well, in the same way, even in light of threats that we may experience or the uncertainties of life or the circumstances that are beyond our control, we too are to remain patient by maintaining an attitude of expectancy that the Lord will turn things around in his perfect time. And it tells us here that his coming to help is as sure as a harvest of crops. And so God's prescription when facing stressful times, even facing difficult people, is to persevere with patience. And then he goes on to say, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Fortifying foods with iron is a method used to combat iron deficiency throughout the world. You'll find iron in your cereal. You'll find additional iron in other foodstuffs. Well, that word fortification is interesting because instead of feeling agitated and shaken by the fear of maybe getting COVID or by the, the oppressive measures that are in place, James instructs us to fortify our hearts. Strengthen your hearts. Because they can be troubled by the circumstances we face. And we fortify our hearts with the word of God. 
The Word of God has the power to strengthen our soul when it is overwhelmed with stress by giving it hope for a good outcome. For example, if we go to Psalm 119, this is a psalm that extols the, the benefits of the Word of God. The whole psalm talks about and speaks to the Word of God. Look what it says in verse 28. My soul weeps because of grief. But strengthen me according to your word. Notice the power of the word to strengthen a weakened and grieving heart. Not only does scripture strengthen our souls, so does the nearness of God. The phrase here for the coming of the Lord is near involves both time and space. The Lord is near in time means that his return could happen at any moment. We could leave this building and before the day is over, the Lord could have returned. No prophetic thing needs to happen for him to return and rapture his church. But it also has a space element to it. Space meaning spatial. The Lord is near refers to the nearness of his presence. For example, if we go to Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the same word is used. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, the kingdom of God was in the person of Christ Jesus. And he was there, spatially. So this at hand means his presence is near. So the Lord is near both in his coming and both in his presence right now by his spirit. In fact, the word tells us that he is here now. When two or more come together, I am with you, Jesus said. And so he draws near even in that way. In verse 9 it says, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. <clears throat> well, I know... For my, I'll speak of my own experience under the burden and pressure of, of COVID and all the measures that are put in place. I get cranky and irritated and start complaining. Now the word complain here means to foist our internal grief onto another person. It has a sense of voicing our bad and cranky attitude onto others. And James tells us that we shouldn't be doing that. Now, James is not callous towards stressful situations, which can put us on edge, but he is concerned about the tendency to project our irritation onto others. And so instead of foisting our fears on others, we need to voice our complaints to the Lord. Because he is standing by, not only as judge, but as one who comes alongside ready to help. And so I'm learning, rather than foist my grievances or my complaints or my crankiness onto others, I need to come before the Lord and express these concerns to Him. Now Jesus, G James knows the value of role models. So not only does he supply the example of farmers to teach us patience, he also uses two more examples of those who have patiently persevered under trials. And the one is the prophets. Verse 10, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And so even prophets of the Lord were not exempt from ill treatment. In fact, their steadfast commitment to truth is what provoked the world's fury. And I can guarantee you that'll be the same today. And as we make a stand for truth, as we make a stand for the gospel, as we represent Christ Jesus to others, we will experience persecution in one form or another. And so the prophet Jeremiah is an outstanding example of one who demonstrated patience when suffering maltreatment. If you read his his book in, in the Old Testament, his life was threatened more than once. He was thrown in prison. He was loaded into a dungeon. And yet he persevered. 
and continue the ministry of prophecy without bitterness. Of course, he struggled, but he was not bitter toward the Lord. And then in verse 11, it says, we, can, we count those blessed who endure. You've heard the outcome or the endurance of Job and seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. And so like Jeremiah, Job is also an example of endurance. You can read about him also in the Old Testament. Now he didn't have to endure persecution. Well, maybe his counselors persecuted him a little bit, but not to the same extent as Jeremiah did. But he did certainly have to endure physical pain. And both of these men, Jeremiah and Job, remained brave under trial. And both experienced God in powerful ways. It tells us here that the Lord intervened with compassion and mercy. God in his compassion provides for our needs in a time of crisis. And the Lord in his mercy keeps us from being destroyed by the crisis. And so God's prescription during difficult times, during times of uncertainty, during times of pandemics, during this COVID is to remain patient by exercising self-restraint. And through patience, we discover the Lord's compassion and mercy. And not only should we practice patience, we should also refrain from pious vows. In verse 12, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any, any other oath, but your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. A few years ago, actually before we moved to Carbon, we lived in, in Abu Dhabi, and I taught uh, high school science there. And I remember one day I had, to, I had to confront a student who was bullying another student in the class. And so I took him aside, and, and I asked him about his behavior, and he, re, and he responded, he said, I swear to you, Mr. Munin, on the life of my mother, it wasn't me. And I replied, <laughs> after kind of shocked as why he would do that, so why are you swearing on the life of your mother? All you need to say is, yes, it was me, or no, it was not me. The reason why I remember that is because I was shocked. I never heard anyone do that. Well, sometimes we feel the need to add an oath to affirm the truth of our words. Adding oaths to our statements is an admission that our word is weak and often unreliable. In fact, a court of law, a court of law finds it crucial to place a witness under oath to tell the truth. And this is a confession that they recognize witnesses may lie. And so the need for oaths is a clue of our propensity to deceive. But as Christians, as born again believers, as those who have the Spirit of God living in us, our character, integrity, and honesty should be such that there is no need to support the truth of our statements with an oath. We are truth tellers. And no one should suspect us of deception. And so when making an affirmation or a denial, others should be able to trust our word as true. We should be so honest in our speech that when we say yes, it is yes, and when we say no, it is no. In fact, Jesus gave a teaching on that, and maybe that's where James is getting it from. He, was, he spoke about this on the Sermon on the Mount. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37, it says, Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white, one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, and no, no, anything beyond these 
of the evil one. And so we're truth speakers. We don't need to substantiate or to uh, add oaths to make our speech more trustworthy. Now James is speaking about oaths in our conversations with one another. He is not prohibiting oaths in a court of law. And so what we're seeing here in this passage is that God's prescription during difficult times, the times that we're in, is to remain patient by exercising self-restraint in our speech. And through this patience, we discover the Lord's compassion and mercy. And not only should we practice patience, we should also practice prayer and praise. There's an ancient tradition that says James spent so much time, so much time on his knees praying for his people that his knees became as hard as camel's knees. James is called camel's knees because he prayed so much. And so when James speaks on praying, he speaks as an expert. He's got personal experience. And so this is what he says about prayer in verse 13. If anyone among you is suffering, then he must pray. If anyone is cheerful, he is to sing praises. And so James is telling us here, prayer is encouraged for all occasions. We should pray to God in times of sadness. We should praise God in times of success. I must testify that is something that, is, that I keep forgetting to do. When God answers my prayers, I often neglect to offer him praise for the answer. A vital faith praises God and prays to God whether circumstances are good or bad. And so rather than engage in self-pity, as I was mentioning before, rather than lashing out at others, when experiencing misfortune, our first response is to pray. And to pray until the calamity is over or until we are given strength to endure. And then our prayer should be converted to praise. So prayer should be our first response to sorrow. Prayer should be our first, praise should be our first response to success. And prayer should also be our first response to sickness. Let's look at verses 14 and 15 and half of 16. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And their prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And so, prayer should be our first response in times of sickness. Now, the term sickness here is any illness that hinders our ability to perform day-to-day -day functions. It may even include being on the brink of death. And notice... It is not up to the elders to search for the sick among the congregation. The onus is on the one who is sick to initiate the call. And the elders then go to the house of the person and pray. The scene here is one of the privacy of the home. And so what is required? Oh, sorry. Notice also. Notice also the elders are called and not faith healers. It doesn't say call one who has the gift of healing. It doesn't say that. It says call the elders. So the gift of healing is not required. What is required are spiritual leaders who pray in faith and in the name of Christ Jesus. And notice further, elders is in the plural. It doesn't say that, you know, call the elder of the church. It says called the elders of the church. It's plural. And this suggests more than one elder is to go to the home of a sick person and pray. In fact, I remember several years ago when I was pastoring in a church in Ditsbury. 
One of the families, their son had this rash. This, they couldn't figure out how to treat this rash. And they, they called us. They called me and a few other elders. We went down there, anointed with oil. We prayed. We didn't have gift of healing. We were kind of struggling with how to do this. <clears throat> and the Lord heard. He was recovered from his rash. Without, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to say this later on, but God can heal directly and God can heal through medical means. I'm not saying that this is the only way he does it, but this is how he did in that case. So more than one elder goes to the home of the sick and anointing with oil here is the secondary activity. It is not the primary activity. The primary activity is to pray. But why anoint with oil? What's up with anointing with oil? Well, there are two views on this. I'm going to go through this real quickly. The first view is that the oil is deemed sacramental. In other words, the oil has supernatural powers to it. It's medicinal and it has healing powers. That's one view. The other view, which I believe is the view that James is, is teaching here and the view that I would take, is that oil is symbolic. It is the symbol of the Holy Spirit by whose power the cure is brought about. And so by anointing with oil, what we are saying is the Holy Spirit is bringing about the healing. And the Holy Spirit may heal directly, as the case in that example I gave you. However, most times, the Holy Spirit performs healing through modern medicine. And this doesn't undermine the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just the Spirit chooses to use modern medicine to accomplish the healing. So our first response when sick is to receive prayer from the spiritual leaders. And then, as required, we visit the doctor and follow the doctor's orders. And should we be healed of our sickness? Or should we be ultimately healed through a resurrection? In both cases, the healing is brought about by the power of the Spirit, not by the elders, not by the doctors, not by the medicines, not by by the anointing oil. Certainly God will work through the elders, through the doctors, through the medicines, even possibly through the oil, but ultimately it is the Holy Spirit that accomplishes the healing. If we go to uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 13, here Jesus is giving authority to the disciples <clears throat> to do ministry. In, verse 13, in chapter 6, verse 13 in Mark, it says this, And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. And so again, the anointing of the oil, and the Jewish people understood that, that when you anoint with oil, it's a representation that you are getting, uh, that the Holy Spirit is at work. And so they would understand this, this uh, oil is a symbol that the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish the healing now, at the most basic level, sickness is due to living in a fallen world. As a result of the fall, sickness entered, sickness and death entered into the human race. But notice here it says, um, if, in verse 15, the, 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 the bottom part of verse 15, it says, if he has committed sins. So the conditional clause if he has sinned, makes clear that sometimes, and I'm going to stress that, sometimes specific and persistent sin can be the direct cause of sickness. Persistent sin in the life of the Christian results in God's discipline. God will discipline us if we continue to persist in sin. And sometimes that discipline may take the form of sickness. And the Lord will remove his discipline upon confession of sin. But should confession not happen, then divine chastisement persists. In fact, we have an example of this in 1 Corinthians 11. This is the verse, the section that I was reading earlier on when we were celebrating communion. And so as we know, communion is to be done in, a, in an honoring way. We've got to make sure that we are right with the Lord before we take of the elements. Because it says in verse 30, for this reason, because they were partaking of the elements in an un, 
unworthy manner, it says, for this reason many among you are sick, are weak and sick, and a number are asleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. And so evidently some of the, of the believers in Corinth were sick because they were persisting in sin. And so sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes illness can be a direct result of persistent sin as a means of God chastising us. And then in verse 16, the second half, back in James to verse 18, it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And remember, I keep stressing this, that in, in, in the Greek, when it says man, it, it, it refers to both, humanity. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Notice his prayer affected nature. His prayer affected the, 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 the things in creation. And that says that our prayers can have an impact. I mean, we have these COVID prayer times that we meet at 1 o'clock from Monday to Thursday online. You know, and we're praying, Lord, diminish the, the spread of the virus. Diminish the, the, the threat of this virus around the world. And, you know, the Lord hasn't done it yet, but it doesn't mean he won't. And so our prayers can affect nature. In fact, when Jesus uh, calmed the storm, the storm was, was rebuked, meaning that the storm was out of line of God's will. And so Jesus rebuked it, and it was corrected. And so prayer should be our first response, because great victories can be expected through prayer. The Greek word here used for prayer in these verses, uh, 16 to 18, is petition or supplication. There's four words in Greek for prayer. This one here is petition and supplication. These are, these are kind of warfare-like prayers. They're prayers that, that engage with the spiritual forces of evil that resist the will of God. And so by persisting in supplication in the name of Christ Jesus, we overcome the resistance by the power of the Spirit so that the will of God prevails. Jesus, in, in his, uh, when the disciples asked him, teach us to pray, he said, you know, he gave him some instructions. He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which suggests that his will is not being done on earth. And so we can pray that his will prevails. But it requires a persistence in our supplications. And then it tells us here the condition for prevailing prayer. The condition is to be righteous. The effective prayer, the word there can be the, effect, the effective supplications of a righteous man can accomplish much. And so the condition for prevailing prayer is to be righteous. Now what does it mean to be righteous? Does it mean that we, you know, we reach a certain level of super spirituality and then we can prevail in prayer? No. What it means to be righteous is first to be weak in our humanity. Secondly, it's to be in a right relationship with the Lord. And third, to be righteous is to have confessed all known sin. Those are the conditions. We don't have to be a super saint. In fact, James seeks to dispel the notion that common folk like you and me could never expect to achieve much in prayers. He's trying to dispel that notion. What he's teaching us here is that answers to prayer are within the reach of every Christian. And James presents Elijah as proof. Now we often think of Elijah as a super saint, but he was weak in his humanity, just like we are. He struggled with the same temptations we do. He faced depression. He faced discouragement. He faced fear. And yet, in the weakness of his humanity, he prevailed in prayer. And so the prayer of those who are in a right relationship with the Lord can accomplish much because the power of our prayers is related to the power of our God. And so what we're seeing here in chapter 5 
of James as we finish our series in the book of James that the Lord's prescription during times of distress is for all believers to persevere with patience, to practice prayer and praise, and lastly, to pursue prodigals in verses 19 to 20. My brethren, if any of you strays from the truth and one turns him back, sorry, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's how James ends his letter. He doesn't end it by saying, you know, say, ho so, say hello to so-and-so like Paul does. He just ends it like that. Well, the tragic reality is that too often Christians wander from the faith they once followed. Now, there's many factors that may cause this. The weakness of our humanity, the power of the devil, the pull of the world with its allurements, the threat of persecution, even the problem of pandemics. These can cause people to stray away from the Lord. Hardship, trials, afflictions can cause people to stray from the Lord. As tragic as that is, what is also tragic is we who remain faithful do not take our responsibility serious enough to seek to bring a wandering Christian back from the air of his or her ways. And I appreciate, Linda, and your testimony there that you took your grandson out on a regular basis to share with him the good news of Christ Jesus. During these times, people are falling away from the Lord. And we need to seek to bring them back. And perhaps we've done that. Perhaps we've tried to do this in the past and we've encountered resistance over and over again, so we just gave up. You know, I'm told when seeking to save a drowning person, often in their state of panic, they fight off the rescuer. And it would be tragic if the rescuer said, well, that's it, I'm not going to try and save them and let them drown. Well, in the same way, we should do whatever we can, even if there is resistance, even if there is opposition. We should do whatever we can and not give up while seeking to bring a wandering Christian back into a vital relationship with the Lord. I remember when I wasn't a Christian and my sister would share the gospel with me. I would yell at her, I would do all sorts of nasty things to her, but she persisted. And over time, I came to the Lord. And the one who is restored and the one restoring receives untold blessing. And so let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll end with that. And some quick concluding thoughts. Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. There it again. Again, the exhortation to go and bring back, to pursue the prodigals, to seek to bring them back into that vital relationship with the Lord in a spirit of of gentleness. And so in conclusion, real quick, we're just going to recap what was said. The Lord's prescription to get through the COVID crisis for all of us, all believers, is to persevere with patience, to engage in prayer and praise, and to pursue the prodigals in our midst. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a God of compassion, a God of mercy, a God who is near. Not only are you near in your return, but you are near right now with, by your presence. And Lord, I know that for some of us, I'll speak for myself, I'm getting impatient and irritable about the measures that are constantly coming down and changing and it's just frustrating but Lord we you tell us we are to be patient and persevere you tell us that we are to be in prayer and in praise 
You tell us to persevere in our supplications and our petitions. Because we know from your word that when we do, you answer. And so, Lord, we're asking that you would help us to take these instructions to heart. That we would be patient with one another. That even though people may not be following the, the measures as we think they should or or people may be following the measures when we don't think they should and all this sort of division that's coming on. Lord, help us to just be patient with one another. Trusting and knowing that you will get us through this time. And Lord, there are many in our families and our friends, our neighbors who are, have walked away from the faith. Lord, help us to take the initiative to pursue the prodigals among us in a spirit of gentleness, but in a spirit of persistence. Not only as we pursue them with encouragement and words of hope, but also in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control of all things and that you have called us into this great relationship with you, even as we are celebrating in this season of your birth, that you were born to give us, you were born to raise the sons of earth, born to give us second birth. Thank you so much for this gift of salvation that you have freely given to us in Christ Jesus. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. We have a closing song and then we will finish with a benediction. <laughs>